Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to the Cram Podcast. It has been called unforgettable, mesmerizing, soul-shaking, and really weird. I'm talking about a total eclipse of the sun. And this year, Canada is fortunate as parts of the country will be on what's called the path of totality. That means if you're on that path, you'll be able to see the moon completely blocking the sun's rays and the landscape around you will plunge into darkness. It's a mystical, eerie experience for sure. You may cry, there will be shouting and hugging, or you might be speechless from the enormity of this spectacle. Here to shed further light, because it's going to be dark all right, is Andrew Fazekas. He's a science writer, broadcaster, and lecturer, and works with National Geographic, CBC Radio, and CTV News. He's known as the Night Sky Guy. He's an active member and past president of the Montreal Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and he's also the author of National Geographic's Backyard Guide to the Night Sky. Welcome, Andrew. So great to have you here. Mary, it's great to to be on your show. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Okay, so most important, how are you preparing for the upcoming eclipse? Oh, uh, wow. Well, it's, it's a family affair for, uh, for me. I'm, I have my two daughters, teenage daughters, my wife. We're going to be, we're very fortunate because we live very close to the path of totality. I'm just outside of Montreal, just west off the island. And literally my house is, uh, less than a kilometer from the edge of totality. So I just have to literally, I, if I wanted to, I could take a fi- a, f- a few minutes walk to uh, my local pharmacy parking lot and just see it from there. But I'm going to be heading south into the eastern townships closer to the border with the u.s because i want to head deeper into the path of totality deeper into it because the the maximum eclipse where everything seems dark when the moon completely covers the disk of the sun is longer it lasts that those moments last longer the closer you are to the center line of the path of totality so for me that's important. I want to, I want to soak in as much of that darkness as possible. So I, I gain actually maybe a minute or a minute and a half longer if I just head south, uh, maybe a half hour, an hour by car. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I myself have never witnessed a total eclipse and I'm super excited about it. But do you know what? The thing is, I now have read so many mind-blowing accounts of people who've witnessed eclipses like all around the world, right? That I'm almost nervous that it's going to be anticlimactic. So I'm wondering, because I know you've seen a total eclipse, right? A total solar eclipse. Okay. Um, Is it as mind-blowing as people say it is? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I've been, I've been shouting from the rooftops in the air where I am to all my friends, my network. Don't miss out if you can g- grab this chance because usually totality, this total eclipse of the sun, uh, is in remote regions. They really, and, and just to give you an example of the rarity, any one spot on earth, any one location where you are right now, it, on average, only experiences totality once every three centuries. So you really want to try to get to a spot where you can, where you can see this. It's, it's transformative in many ways. It, it's humbling. It can bring a tear to your eye. You can start crying. I've seen people cry. Uh, I was very fortunate. I saw the 2017 August eclipse. Uh, I've traveled just north of uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I was on a beach with over 30,000 people. My family was there, my girls. They were, they were, uh, I think they were like eight and nine at the time. And it was unbelievable. I even got, I even convinced a friend with his family, a good friend of mine from Germany to come over. I convinced him to come. He's not a space nerd, not interested in it. But I said, you have to come and see it. Let's go and make an adventure. We went headed down on a family trip with my friends. We staked out a place in on the beach. We spent the whole day there and it was cloudy. We were so oh. bummed out. We were so bummed out. He says, I can't believe it. I, and I felt so bad because I convinced my friend to take <laughs> this long journey with his family. And, you know, we're, we're having a good time on the beach, but it's cloudy. And then when in the afternoon, uh, 
15 minutes before totality, before uh, the, the moon completely covered the sun, it opened up. The skies opened up and, and it was like a rock concert. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. This people around me were hooting, hollering, uh, screaming. It really felt like it was a concert that we were at. And, uh, we saw the, the shadow of the, uh, of, uh, the moon racing across the landscape towards us at very racing? high speeds. Racing, racing is racing quite at, the, really at very high speeds, just coming towards us. Wow. And uh, literally the darkness just fell over us. Well, of course, we had eclipse glasses watching it safely. And then when the darkness uh, fell on us, and that's when the entire disk of the moon covers the the, the sun completely. Right. Uh, it's, it's so weird. It's unearthly almost because suddenly it, uh, the dark, it's not completely dark, not like middle of the night dark, but it's kind of like twilight. If you can imagine about, you know, maybe a three quarters of an hour after a sunset type of darkness where you have like towards the horizon, you see the, uh, there's light, but above you, it's dark stars come out. Uh, certain uh, like wildlife associated with sunset time periods start making noises like bir certain bird species start chirping. Uh, the crickets you can hear at, at uh, if it was in, you know, if there is crickets at that time of the year, we heard them uh, on the beach. It was unbelievable. And there's this cool, definite coolness in the temperature that you experience mm. at the time of totality. So it's a multi-sensory experience. And, and of course you see like, with the dark where we had, there were like thunderstorms even in the distance. You could see them with the uh, with the the lightning happening. It was it was just too much almost. <laughs> it's like to, like to, to, like a to total sensory experience, right? Absolutely, and it only lasts for a few minutes, a precious few minutes, and then it's over. And then the sun just pops out again. A burst of sunshine comes out, and then we're you're on the other side, and it's just like you you need. To, you need the glasses again to see that partial phase where it looks like a big bite is taken out of the, the sun, right? It looks like a crescent sun. But yeah. that moment of totality is really the magical moment. That's the, that's the, what you want to experience. So I'm really interested in knowing during those few minutes how you felt because you're also a science guy, right? You're a science nerd. So I wonder yeah. whether you felt it just as a human being or whether you couldn't help, but the science guy was in there trying to, you know, sort of figure out all yeah, the yeah. science. You know what I mean? Like, what did you, how did you feel? Uh, as the science guy, I appreciated what the celestial mechanics that was at play. And I was at awe simply at the science of what's going on to experience it, to be at the right place at the right time, celestially speaking. Right. But I can't help, but it, it's a very, um, it's a very guttural moment. Uh, mm. it's very hard to put into words because it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's interesting because it's similar to say if you saw the, uh, you know, you were on the edge of the Grand Canyon and you saw it out before you, the awe and beauty of nature at its best. It's awe inspiring, right? You, I mean, you can see a beautiful sunset and, uh, you know, over the ocean and it can be awe inspiring to see. It's just that magical na natural moment in time. And that's what it is. And in fact, it's really interesting. It's been shown by science that astronomical, like celestial events is, uh, is filled with awe and wonder and it elicits certain very psychological uh, emotions and like empathy builds, oh. uh, you know, that's so being so, wanting to socially connect with others too. It's something that, you know, you, you become very emotional uh, at those moments. And that's why it's very hard to tell people because they say, Oh, well, I've seen an eclipse so many times. I've, I've talked to friends and family. I said, yeah, I've seen one of those. <laughs> yeah. So, Oh, okay. What was that? Yeah, it was okay. But, but was it total? You know, if I look at when was that and I check the mm. date, you know, and I go, Oh, that wasn't total. So you haven't really seen a total. Anyone who's actually seen a total, they understand. There's like this immediate understanding of what 
that experience is. is. And that's why I kind of like almost begging people to do yeah. take advantage because it's literally in our backyard right now, uh, this event. You don't have to travel to like a, a remote South Pacific island uh, or on a cruise to Antarctica to see this. It's coming right to our neck of the woods. So you don't want to miss it. Okay. Well, before we talk about what is specifically happening on April the 8th here in Canada, um, I wonder if we could have a little bit of history. Um, you know, how long have we known about solar eclipses? You know, you know, how was it that human beings even discovered them? Yeah, you know, I, I, it, it has very ancient roots, obviously. And, and, and we can only go back until there are written records or, uh, uh some kind of re uh, recordings of that in, in some sense. And we can go back like there's, um, uh, in Syria, in, I think the, 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 one of the, the oldest recordings is goes back to 1345. BC, uh, a clay tablet showing that, uh, explaining the idea of the sun disappearing in the sky. So, and we can actually trace that back with our modern planetarium software programs. You can kind of go back in time and say, oh yeah, it actually did happen. So it was a bona fide recording. And there are, you know, multiple events throughout the world that has, uh, you know, historically significant, uh, solar eclipses where battles were waged. Uh, there were, uh, poetry written about it. Um, and there's a lot of myths attached to it, cultural myths. Like there's ones like there's Norse, m Norse mythology involves, uh, a, a wolf devouring the sun. Um, in Vietnam, there are, uh, stories related to a giant celestial frog gobbling up the sun um and um so there's many in in, in ancient china chinese uh astro astrology there was when and you have to remember back in thousands of years ago astrology and astronomy was kind of intertwined right the two mm -hmm. so there's the the mythical dragon devouring the sun and it's it's really interesting because there's this constant theme of natural uh natural beasts, you know, uh, of animals interacting celestially uh, with the sun and the moon at play. So it's very, very interesting. It's just a common theme throughout all cultures around the world. Um, but there's, you have to remember, it's interesting because you know, back in ancient times, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the communication that we have now um, in modern times. And so a lot of these Folks that experienced eclipses, they did that in that moment in time, and then it was re maybe recorded traditionally, but that was it. And then there was no e other eclipse in that region for maybe, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. of years. As mm -hmm. I said, no one place can experience an eclipse on average more, th uh, more than once every three centuries. Right. So uh, that, that magical event, of those few moments of totality is really what those ancients really experienced. I mean, a partial eclipse where it looks like a bite taken out of the sun, you wouldn't notice unless you had, uh, you know, special eclipse glasses, which they didn't in the ancient times, they probably wouldn't even notice there was a partial eclipse, the moon, you know, right. traveling in front of the sun, unless it was in that magical path of totality. And by the way, that to to path of totality is about on average around 200 kilometers wide. Right. And it can travel thousands of kilometers, but it's only 200. 200. Kilometers wide. Yeah. If you're e on either side of that path, that thin path, you see yeah. a partial potentially. But if you don't have glasses, you probably won't even notice that it's darkening. The average person won't notice anything. So imagine to, the, to all those ancient cultures, those ancient people would have probably had partial eclipses happen where they are, but never would have known about them because right. there was no, nothing happening physically and they couldn't really see the sun, you yeah. know, undergoing that. So it's the totality. And those, those rare moments of totality have been recorded across the world, uh, since ancient times. Oh and God. they have been really feared by many cultures too. <gasps> well, I Even can imagine, to, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden everything goes dark when it's not supposed to in the middle of the day. That would freak people out. I would think they imagine it's the end of the world. Absolutely. We're all going to die. Yeah, exactly. And even today, there are strange superstitions attached to it. Like um, in some parts of India, I've read that uh, you know, that pregnant women and children need to shelter in indoors during totality, during a solar eclipse. It's, it's dangerous to their health. Uh, other, uh, 
uh, myths in the in that region also say uh, you don't cook anything, don't be careful of food because it could be poisoned with radiation coming from the sun. So there's a lot of that kind of fear, and yeah. that goes back again to ancient times. There were you know moments in in history where there were uh, you know they were o- considered omen bad omens. Uh, you know, portents of, of, of disease, pestilence, of war, uh, you know, it was bad omens, you know, and, and that's, that's still happening. And like I said, in certain cultures today. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk, um, about the science, um, behind solar eclipses. And it's funny too, because, you know, we talked about the total solar eclipse and that narrow band, and that's rare, right? That only hits a certain part of the world every few centuries. Um, but solar eclipses happen quite regularly, right? So can, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So can you talk about that? And also what is actually happening with the moon, the sun and the earth? Yeah. So uh, the, the, uh, let's just put the actors at play here are the sun, the moon and earth in that order. So you have a perfect alignment between these three celestial bodies, the sun, moon, and earth. And if you think of the sun is, is uh, shining on the moon, and if the moon goes in front of the sun, if we're over here, it, the moon will cast a shadow on our planet. And it's amazing, by the way, I, uh, I highly recommend folks Google this, uh, looking at lo- the lunar shadow on the earth, because thanks to satellites, we can actually see beautiful shots of the moon, the circular shadow of the moon uh, projected onto the surface of the earth uh, through, thanks to satellite photographers. That's, that's absolutely amazing to see that. And there's even little videos, movies showing that satellites take of that that shadow or the, the lunar shadow racing across oh. a, uh, the surface of the earth. So uh, that's basically what's happening with today. It's the perfect alignment. Now, people ask, well, well, if that happens, you know, why don't we have once every month as the moon cycles through it, as it orbits the earth and it lines, you know, and it, and it happens during new moon, by the way, obviously you can't see the moon because it's, it's close to the sun. Um, and the moon takes 28 days to, to cycle through a month. How come we don't see one every month? And that's because the moon's orbit compared to earth's orbit around the sun is tilted about five degrees, the lunar orbit. And so s- most of the time, the moon uh, travels underneath the sun from our vantage point or just above the disk of the sun. But tw- about twice a year, every six months, it does line up and depends on where you are on the earth at the time of that, that you, if you're lucky enough, you could see that uh, either a partial eclipse or a total eclipse. So the difference between a partial eclipse is that it's you know, only it, it kind of races in partially in front of the sun, doesn't mm. completely cover it. It kind of moves just, you know, it could take a little bite. It could take a massive bite or completely cover it. And we're lucky because this time it's a complete coverage of the, of the disk of the sun. Right. The other thing that's really cool about uh, a solar eclipse is the coincidence that the, the sun, which is 400, is 400 times larger than the moon happens to be 400 times more distant than the moon, creating this perfect uh, perfect coincidence of the sizes of the two disks of these two very different objects being almost exactly the same, right? That's when incredible. Them, Hold it. I, it? I, wanna, I gotta stop. <laughs> yes, the, let that okay, sink that's in. Incre- so the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but also 400 times the distance away from the moon. Right. And because of that, we have this wonderful, we live in this wonderful time period right now where we do experience these beautiful total eclipses, right? Uh, of, uh, and, and we can, e- and there are a variety of other eclipses too. Um, they're not just par- partials we'll see, but there's also something called the annular eclipse when the moon is slightly smaller than the disk of the sun. That's what happened ah, okay. in October last year, right? We had okay. that other eclipse six months ago. We had another solar right. eclipse. Okay, can right? I just stop you again? Because you said something yeah. else I have to question. You said we're lucky that we live in this time period where this can happen. So are you saying that the distance between the sun and the moon is not always 400 times? Well, it's not exactly perfectly. So the moon also can get closer to the sun. It is in a, the moon is in an elliptical orbit, an egg-shaped orbit around the sun, uh, the earth, I should say. And so because of that, there are times when the moon is slightly closer to the earth 
and sometimes right. slightly far away. We call that apogee and perigee. And, you, and I think most people would refer to the perigee moon as a super moon. We've all heard of oh, this in the right. media okay. lately, right? Super yes. moons, right? And yes. the full moon, and it's slightly bigger and brighter than the average full moon. Right. Okay, so that happens when the moon is slightly closer to us. Okay. And actually, what's really cool about this eclipse that makes this one on April 8th so special, added to that, is that the moon is close to perigee at that time. Wow. So meaning it is closer to us than average, meaning that the moon is slightly bigger, which means that it'll take longer to travel across the the disk of the sun, which means that the moment of totality, that few precious minutes is yes. slightly longer than some other eclipses. So we're lucky. We get, we get to experience totality for either a few seconds or a few minutes longer. Right? So, in fact, it's, if you oh were in Mexico, yeah. if you were, Mary, if you were in Mexico. Yeah. And, um, um, on the Western coast of Mexico, where the first, where, where, where the shadow of the moon first hits the continent. On April 8th, you can experience almost four and a half minutes of totality there. That's the longest space. If you want to really be in the longest, that's where, that's where it'll be uh, the longest. By the time it reaches uh, Canada, the longest is about three, three and a half minutes. So, uh, um, so that all has to do with the, the fact that the moon is at perigee. It's closer. Mm -hmm. It's long. There are even in history, there are times where it could last as long as seven minutes. That's very mm -hmm. rare. That last time that happened was in the early 1970s, and it won't happen for at least another century. So there are moments when that pa So that all has to do with the 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 distances of between these objects, between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun. Right. right? All of everything we're yeah. talking about here is yes. related to that, and that yes. influences how we experience as sky watchers this wonderful event i still can't get over that <laughs> it's the same distance as the size of the moon like or sorry yeah. compared to the moon. i yeah. can't get like it almost seems is that a coincidence how did that happen like, well it's <laughs> happened we're just lucky that we are is it luck so is it really luck <laughs> It's, it's, it is amazing because, uh, you know, back in, back in, you know, millions of years ago, the, the moon was, uh, at a different distance and we weren't getting it. And in the future, we, uh, the moon is actually going away, is, is, is drawing away from us. So maybe in like, I don't quote me, but you know, a million years from now, if there are people still on earth, they may never experience a total eclipse. Uh, why where is, it gets why is the moon drawing away, moving away from it's us? It's just why? because of the, it's the, the mechanics of the moon okay. as it's orbiting, it's slowly just being drawn away. But, but what's interesting is that this coincidence in time that here we are right now, it's that perfect alignment it's the perfect size where we can get that blockage of the sun and e experience this darkness for a few <laughs> precious moments. And, and is the pinnacle of this what's called that diamond ring? When you see, oh, what? yeah, there's some, there's something oh, okay, called what, the diamond yeah, ring. Yeah, what is yeah. that? It's also something called be Bailey's beads. Okay, so what this is, Bailey's beads and the diamond ring, and what this has to do, it happens within the first the last few moments before totality before the uh, the entire disk of the moon completely covers just that that frac few seconds before and it happens a few seconds after as it's moving off the the disk of the sun what it is and this again blows my mind no this is where you know the science and you appreciate what you're seeing is there's it, it bailey's bees and, and diamond ring effect is basically these little spots of bursts of light that look like little beads on the side could be one that's the diamond ring effect or it could be multiples those called bailey beads little spots of bursts of sunlight that are on the edge of the disk of the moon while most of the disc is cov is, is, uh, is, you know, completely covering the sun, there's yeah. still a few precious little bits that shine through. And why they look like beads, like little points of light, is the t rough terrain of the moon. The edge of the moon, the disc of the moon, isn't completely round. It's right. There's mountains, right. there's valleys. And it's as that sun is shining in between the mountaintops and the valley and through the valleys, those spots, those open spots in that rough terrain, it's shining through that. And that's why it looks like little beads. 
Did it you only see- lasts for a few seconds. Did you see that when you saw the total I eclipse? Saw, yes, yes, it's 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 incredible, and that's why I'm saying it's beautiful, right? It's absolutely gorgeous. The effect of the diamond ring and Belia, but knowing what it is, you're actually looking at the sun in between peaks of mountains. That that's is what that so is. So cool. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let's now talk specifically about the April eighth solar eclipse. You said that it starts in Mexico. Is that right? Me- the shadow. That's of right. Mexico. So t- so, go- yeah. And then where? Yeah. Like what? Travel and then back. it travels through, uh, um, through Texas. Um, and then through, uh, places like Indiana, Ohio, up through Maine. But it, and, and, and at that point it, it goes the path of totality, of course, is what I'm talking about here. That's that 200 kilometer wide little path actually goes through su- southwestern Ontario, uh, southeast, sorry, Ontario, going through places like Hamilton, um, just, just misses Toronto, really, basically, but then uh, hits uh, Montreal, right, and then goes into the Atlantic provinces. Um, and what's really cool is that the pathway is through such populated areas, it's very different from the one that happened in 2017. There's a lot more people that are in the past, they're estimating something like just somebody, like there's about 30 million people that can just literally step out of their uh, doorstep and watch totality that are in. And that doesn't count all the people that are traveling in the path, you know? Yeah. Um, Some of the most popular right now destinations is Southern Texas, places like Austin, Dallas, uh, San Antonio, they're going to be in the pathway. Right. Of it. And so, and the expectation, the weather forecast is really good there. They're the, be- that's the best place, uh, in North America with the least amount of clouds right now is, uh, Southern Texas and Mexico for people to actually okay. see totality, get a chance with the weather, the weather. Oh, cooperating. The we- see, this is, that's what I was going to ask you. I wondered whether, let's just say, given equal weather, across the total path of totality, is it the same everywhere? Is it is weather the determinant of where, you know, it's the best place to watch? Yeah, really right now, the weather is the most, it's it's the one that's the most unpredictable. Everything mm. else was predictable. We know exactly okay. when it starts, when it ends, when's maximum, where geographically, what it's exactly going to look like, right? We can map all of that out. What right. the problem is, is the weather. It will come out. And traditionally, this time in, in North America in April, it's very, uh, you know, tumultuous, the weather. It's that fight between winter and summer type of weather patterns that are occurring. And this is where what we can do is go use our computer models and look at historical data. And if you, we look at the historical data, like for Canada, uh, you know, Southern Ontario, Southern Quebec, this area where there's huge uh, populations that are going to be under the totality. We know that historically over the last quarter century, about 60 on average, 60% of the time it's cloudy on I April see, 8th. Okay. On April, we can look at the April 8th data. Yeah, right. So um, the thing is, uh, if we had perfectly clear skies and the sun, would we actually have the same visual experience as someone in Austin, Texas would? Yes. Oh, we would. Yes. Okay. And this is mm. and this is the beauty of this event too. It brings people together from so many like it's it draws humanity together because we're experiencing the same celestial event across huge geographical regions, right? It's yeah. it's uh you know, it this is part of that humbling aspect, the awe aspect of this event is thinking that here I am, I could be on one side of the continent, and you may have friends and family all the way on the other side. You know, it takes you five, six hours on a plane ride to get to your friends, but they're going to be experiencing that event uh, like yeah. you are in the, in the sky. Right. Isn't you know, that it, beautiful? It's beautiful. It almost seems like the anti-pandemic experience. You know, something really yeah. great that brings us together, not something not together. good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. And that's why I always say, you know, see it with friends and family, you know, be in contact. It, it's just so magical to see it. You know, I'm, I'm in Montreal. So I'm, I'm at the, at the mercy of the clouds too here, very much so. But, you know, I'm going to be waiting probably. I'm going to, the night before Sunday night on the, I'm going to be looking at the forecast and, and trying to peg out some areas where I could go by car 
And then literally, probably that morning of is when the forecast really crystallizes is when um, I'm going to try to see which, you know, and make a, make a, cho- a, fi- a final make, choice of where I'm headed. Make a dash. Yeah. Make a dash. Yeah. Wherever that, I have a clear, even like I said, if it's partly clear, you can see it. Even if it's partly, if it's totally overcast and you're in the path, you will still, it's still, there's something you will experience is that darkness, even probably okay. even more so, I would suspect, because you yeah. have that layer of cloud plus the totality, it will get even darker. I mean, probably lights, you know, like parking lot lights will go on and things like that will, right. you know, anything on automatic will turn on <laughs> because it will be that dark. It'll be that dark. You know, one thing I've, I've noticed this year in particular, and I guess it's because it's so rare that it comes to this part of Canada, but um, the, the amount of attention paid to safety. Right. I mean, that, we've been hearing so much about, you know, the safety and watching it and needing certain glasses. Can you just say a quick word on that? Just so if people haven't heard. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. So safety is very important. Our eyes, right? Um, we, you can be temporarily or permanently blinded, actually. Uh, by burning uh, your retina in your eye. And uh, so to prevent that, I mean, the sun, you're never supposed to look at the sun. And during the eclipse, the reason is it's not that there's more rays or anything. It's just that there, you're going to want to watch, everyone wants to watch this magical event, right? So you'll stare at it, trying to see it. And that's where your eyes can get damaged. So to prevent that, you need glasses, uh, special solar uh, eclipse glasses. There's, there's, it's a, it's, this is an example of one, uh, what it looks like. And you could see it has this kind of, uh, reflective, uh, material. It's called mylar. And this is, uh, this aluminum type of, uh, looking, uh, uh, shiny material blocks out like 99.9999% of the solar rays. And it just leaves enough that it's safe to, that enters your eye at safe levels. You can't see anything through these. Okay. So don't go driving in the car to your eclipse with this on because you'll be blinded totally. <laughs> okay. so this is something that you just want to wear watching the partial phase of the eclipse. So as you see the moon traveling across the disk of the sun, taking bigger and bigger bites out of the sun. So it starts looking like a crescent yeah. shape. This is what you watch. And then when the moon completely covers, you know, we talked about Bailey's beads yeah. and all yes. of that. Once it reaches that point where it's dark around you, you take this off. And for those, you know, maybe it's a minute to up to three and a half minutes, right. depending on where you are in the path of totality, you can watch it with the unaided eye safely, right? Because the sun right? is covered. Okay. Yeah, oh, the sun okay. is completely covered. Then once you see those Bailey's beads and, and uh, diamond ring effect come on the other side of the, the totality, you put this back on and then you watch the remainder of the eclipse with this, oh, the partial phase okay. with the glasses. So it's very and- important. And, uh, you know, people have, uh, they can have telescopes, binoculars also outfitted with the same right. type. They make them in, right. in, in, for those shapes, but you don't need a telescope or binocular to see this event. You just the, need them, but those these. are approved too. You, you, I mean, uh, we have that's to also get... important. Yeah. Because yeah. if you see, it has these, what are called like these ISO numbers. Right. Um, and, um, there's a, whole, a, 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 there's a lot of counterfeit and fake out there. So it's best to buy it from a, a trusted source. There okay. are about three manufacturers in uh, the United States that are, that work on these ISO safety, uh, levels. Um, and, um, you know, you can get them at libraries and planetariums if they still have them in stock. And, uh, you shouldn't be paying a lot for them. I mean, they're up, you know, about maybe up to $5 a pair, no more than that. But maybe if you're lucky, you can still grab something from uh, a local organization or an astronomy club. A lot of astronomy okay. clubs are doing stuff and they're handing them out too. All right. Now, is there anything in particular about this eclipse that scientists are interested in? Absolutely. And I think also sky watchers, what we should be looking for. So, uh, for professional astronomers, they're very interested in the outer atmosphere of the sun. And this is called the corona. The corona actually heats up to millions of degrees in temperature. It's the outer atmosphere that spreads out into space around the sun. And, uh, it's invisible to us uh, normally. You can't see it when the sun is just shining. There's no filter that astronomers can use, nothing. It's just invisible. But during totality, those few moments where it gets dark and it's completely covered, the sun's disk, you will see, and this is what sky watchers, we can all see this corona, this outer atmosphere. It looks like a magical, 
how could I describe it? Like flower petals almost stretching out streamers coming out from the, uh, the block disc of the sun. That's the corona and it will be visible to sky watchers and astronomers study this because a lot of our what we call space weather, solar activity that influences uh, us so much here on Earth, you know, produces auroras and things like that. This has a big part to play in solar weather, solar activity, mm. this region of the sun, and it's not well studied. So during those moments of totality, astronomers love to look at the corona. For you and me as sky watchers, we get to see a beautiful light show. It looks like almost like a uh, like a sunflower kind of effect coming out from the sun. It's absolutely be beautiful. There's also other things to watch for. Uh, stars will be visible. Stars that are normally hidden because of its daylight uh, will be visible in the sky around the sun. In fact, there will also be planets. A very, very bright planet will be Jupiter. If you see a very bright star near where the sun is uh, during totality, right. that, is, that is Jupiter. You'll be able to see that in the sky. If you have binoculars, there's even a comet Believe it or not, Mary, there's a comet that is going to be visible in the sky. I Might didn't be know made, that. I haven't heard that yeah, one. Yeah, oh? it's called Pons Brooks. It hmm. comes around once every seven dec uh, 70 years or so. And uh, it's, it's now visible with binoculars um, in the skies in the uh, early, early evening. And it's going to be in the sky at the time of totality. And when it gets dark, those two, three minutes, you may be able to spot that comet with your eye. Isn't that amazing? Wow, that is something. You know, <laughs> I also was listening to um, accounts, uh, both like interviews and also reading accounts of these eclipse chasers, right? Uh -huh, and yeah. yeah, that, I mean, um, you maybe you can identify with them, but I was listening to one guy and he said after his first eclipse, that was it. Like, I, and I guess, I don't know, I'm only imagining it's kind of this high, this incredible once in a lifetime feeling. And you try to keep recapturing that over and over again. Yeah, is that what it is? Like fever. Yeah. It's like you, 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 you want to, you want to experience it again. It's a dopamine high, right? That's what it is. That's what it's hitting, hitting that in your, in your brain. Yeah. It's yeah. releasing the, the, the dopamine. So you want to experience that high again. Uh, and that's what it is. It's like eclipse fever. It really is. And once you get, you get bitten by that bug, a lot of people can't get enough and they, they, they actually, devise their travel plans but, around yeah. eclipses, you know, they will go and travel and they'll go on a cruise to Antarctica, which happened. I had, I've had friends do that, go to, uh, Easter Island, you know, in, in the, in the South Pacific, having a, you know, just a beauty and then ph doing photography, do, you know, creating these frame, beautiful frame photographs of terrestrial objects with, with the eclipse sun, uh, you know, it's, you know, just magical. And yeah, these are eclipsophiles, we call them. <laughs> uh, and they just, they just try. I have a number of friends that have seen dozens of these. Um, and it's, imp they really are hardcore. Like they have yeah. all their equipment. They're ready to go. They plan years in advance, years. They even, some, <laughs> some of them are even scouting out. Like I know there's one friend who, I think it's in 2026 or 2027 is another total eclipse. And he's already down in Australia, checking out, scouting out the location that he wants to go when the eclipse happens. So that's, wow. they're pretty serious folks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are in Canada. We're so lucky here too, in Southern Ontario and you in Montreal, right? It's going to be in our backyard. Oh my goodness. This was a, a fascinating, <laughs> exciting discussion. Andrew, you've got me all pumped now. You got me Good. totally that was up, my, right? That's my point. That's what I want to <laughs> do is pump you up to go yeah. out and view it. Try, attempt it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much and, and happy viewing to you and your family. My pleasure. And I wish everyone clear skies. That is Andrew Fazekas. He is known as the Night Sky Guy. He's a science writer, broadcaster, and lecturer. He works with National Geographic, CBC Radio, CTV News. He's also an active member and past president of the Montreal Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and the author of National Geographic's Backyard Guide to the Night Sky. For more on Andrew and his work, please check out his show notes. He's got a lot on the eclipse. That is it for the Cram Podcast today. We hope you enjoyed it. Please follow us on social. Our handle is at Cram Ideas. Thanks for listening and happy viewing of the solar eclipse.